Okay. What is the bone marrow? The bone marrow is the factory in which blood cells are made. So if you look at the circulating blood in your veins and arteries, they're the product of what goes on in the bone marrow. And where is it found? In all of the, well, as you get older, it becomes more central, but in a newborn, it's found in all of the bones. As you get older, it's restricted to the pelvis, the hip bones, mostly. And how long have bone marrows been done? Bone marrow transplants? Yes. The first transplants were reported in about 1957 or 1958 on five patients with leukemia. None of them were successful, but the proof of principle was demonstrated, and patients with leukemia received bone marrow grafts from unrelated individuals and, in fact, were engrafted. But the first successful bone marrow transplant was done when? The first successful transplants were reported in 1968 in two children at separate institutions with immune deficiencies. And the patients are still alive today? As far as I know, yes. Okay. If we were considering to do a bone marrow transplant, what kind of patients would be considered for a bone marrow transplant? There are a few categories of disease that are amenable right now to bone marrow transplant. Most of our transplants are done for relapsed or refractory leukemia, leukemia being a highly curable disease in pediatrics. But, in fact, when those diseases are not cured, a bone marrow transplant offers an opportunity for salvage of those patients who, prior to bone marrow transplant, could not be cured. There are two types of situations. When you look for a donor that you never knew about to find a bone marrow, and sometimes you get lucky and they could be identical twins. Is that true? Well, interestingly enough, if you have an identical twin, that might be a good donor for malignant disease, but it might not. The concordance rate, the rate of leukemia in identical twins under the age of five, is high enough that one would be taking a fairly high risk using an identical twin. In genetic diseases, the identical twin would be likewise affected with the same genetic twins. Because they would have identical potential problems, is that what you're talking about? Well, they'd have the same, if they were genetically identical, as twins are, identical twins are, they would have the same genetic disease, so they wouldn't serve as a donor. So the best donor is a tissue-compatible sibling, a brother or sister, who shares the tissue antigens that are required to match for transplantation. It's called HLA. Okay. In other words, having the same blood type is not enough. There's other things you would look for, and that would be what? Having the same blood type is not necessary. As we sit here today, we're transplanting a little girl with aplastic anemia, bone marrow failure, and her sister is a donor. They have different blood types, but they have the same HLA type. What does HLA mean? It's human leukocyte antigen, and these are the tissue antigens that permit recognition of the bone marrow by the host and recognition of the host by the bone marrow. If they're not compatible, you can have graft rejection or something called graft-versus-host disease, where the actual marrow graft rejects the host, a very serious and often fatal condition. So we test only for HLA, and the blood groups are not important. In an idealistic situation, I hear that only about 70% of people can find a match. Is that true? Well, it depends where you're looking. If you're looking at siblings based on the size of families and the knowledge that you have a one in four chance of having an HLA match with a sibling, it gives you about a 20% to 25% likelihood of having a sibling donor. So 75% of individuals have to go outside of their family to find donors. And because of that, what's been established is the National Marrow Donor Program and cord blood programs. The National Marrow Donor Program consists of over 6 or 7 million individuals who have been HLA typed, and if in a computer search they show up as compatible donors, they are willing to donate their marrow to an individual who needs a transplant. And with that, I would say you have probably 
uh, 70 or 80 percent uh, likelihood of, of finding a donor, depending upon your ethnic group. Uh, certain ethnic groups are um, more diverse and rarer in our population and are difficult to uh, find donors for, and certain of the more common ethnic groups are easier to find donors for. Um, that's why the, the cord blood system arose. And the cord blood system is really umbilical cord blood collected at the time of birth. Uh, the blood is the blood of the baby, not of the mother. Uh, it's frozen, and uh, serendipitously, it happens to have um, a large number of stem cells or cells capable of, of repopulating a, an adult marrow. Um, so anybody under about 40 or 50 kilos uh, in weight or about 80 to 100 pounds, uh, can uh, avail themselves of a, a cord blood donor. So you're a strong advocate that if you have potentially if a baby was born, you should probably save some of the cord blood? Well, I, I'm, I'm a strong advocate of saving the cord blood, not for that baby, and, and not necessarily for siblings, but to contribute that to the pool. Uh, and if you contribute to the pool, uh, it's available for anybody who may match. If it was cord blood stored, how long could it be stored for bone marrow? Patients have been engrafted over 10 years from the date of storage. We don't have a, a good sense of the upper limit, uh, but with modern freezing and thawing techniques, um, I, I would say that, it, that certainly we're talking decades uh, of, of, of viable cord blood. If someone had a, a hemoglobinopathy, like sickle cell disease, just like that, could a bone marrow cure them of their problems? Yes, uh, we've transplanted a, a number of patients with sickle cell anemia, and in fact, uh, those patients have been cured. Um, the organ damage uh, that they have as a consequence of sickle cell disease uh, ceases to uh, continue, um, and some of the patients uh, have a reversal of some of the damage that they've already had. So patients with significant uh, problems associated with sickle cell disease are candidates for uh, bone marrow transplantation. If you decide that someone's going to get a bone marrow transplant today, it's not really going to the operating room. It can be done at the bedside. Is that true? Well, the, the, the donor is the one who uh, may go to the operating room. Uh, the patient themselves doesn't. The, the donor, if they're going to donate bone marrow, would go to the operating room, and under sterile conditions, we would remove bone marrow from the, the, the hip bones. Uh, that bone marrow would be uh, filtered uh, to remove any small pieces of bone and fat. Uh, and then it's placed in, in a, a, a bag just the same as a blood bag for blood donation and just infused into the patient intra intravenously. Uh, if you look at the bone marrow as containing seeds uh, and, the bone, uh, and, and the bone marrow uh, of the recipient being the garden or the soil, uh, the seeds from the donor are just infused into the, the, the veins of the recipient these seeds know where to go, uh, just as if you throw seeds in the air, they land on the soil. Uh, they attach to, to sites in the bone marrow. They take root uh, and give rise to the flowers or, the, or the, uh, the blood cells. So it's a very simple process for the recipient from that standpoint. It's a little more arduous for the donor, uh, but not necessarily. And now, with modern uh, techniques, we could actually use the peripheral blood of donors uh, to uh, obtain stem cells. So not everybody has to have a marrow harvest. We uh, keep getting better and better or not, in other words. We, we, we do keep getting. We, we've come a long way since 1950s, and we've come a very long way since the first successful transplants. Uh, and now, for, for many diseases, uh, transplant survival and, and cure is in the, close to 90% uh, for diseases that, that uh, prior to transplant would be very morbid or, or fatal.